were inspired by those who reached the podium in all walks of life. Their stories intrigue us. They motivate us. They push us to enhance our own performance. And everyone's story is different. The trajectory of those who reached the podium is rarely a straight path. My conversation today is with a phenomenal young man whose versatility and unflinching obsession and dedication to making it into the NFL has led him from being a top two sport athlete in high school, beginning his collegiate career as a basketball player, but now being one of the top tight ends in the entire league. You're not going to want to miss his story. Welcome to At The Podium. Hello again, and welcome to At The Podium with Manuela Mesqua. I'm a financial advocate, a CEO, father, husband, and as all of you know, a massive sports fan. I'm obsessed with encouraging people to dream and attack their unique vision for their life so that they can inspire others to do the same. We built this podcast to share the stories of some of the highest performers in my life and to help convert their stories into these many golden lessons that can help you get closer to your hopes and dreams. Folks, today my guest is the Tyler Conklin, a native of Chesterfield Township, Michigan. Tyler was a two-sport standout athlete in high school, signing a Division II basketball scholarship at Northwood, and one semester later waking up and saying, I'm going to the NFL. He transferred to Central Michigan where he joined the football team as a walk-on. The story is just incredible. His relentless drive, his toughness, his parents, his two siblings, his brother and his sister were all a part of the journey and a part of the secret to his success as he eventually earned a starting position at Central Michigan at tight end, broke his foot his senior year, and just balled out at the NFL Combine being drafted in the fifth round by the Minnesota Vikings. You will love hearing Tyler speak about so many different moments of adversity that really challenged him to think about what he really wanted in his life, write out his goals, and speak all of his dreams into existence. This is by far one of the most impressive young men I've been around this year, and I'm so excited, and I hope that you enjoy this conversation with Tyler. One of my favorite aspects of the NFL offseason is that we get the absolute privilege to host some of my favorite Michigander humans playing in the league. And today we have an absolute treat for you. We've got my friend Tyler Conklin, New York Jets, tight end. Tyler, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Man, dude, <laughs> in the last 90 days, you have done things that most people take 10 years to do. From this incredible wedding with Scotty, real estate purchases, really starting to get settled out in Jets land. You've got a new teammate that everyone's buzzing about. There's been a lot going on in your life. Tell me how you're feeling right now as you get ready to head into the next season. Yeah, I feel really good. Obviously, from a football standpoint, I'm super excited with what we've done as a team throughout this offseason and with the new quarterback, Aaron Rodgers. So obviously, we're buzzing about that. It's been crazy over the past 90 days, but really the last year and a half and two years since getting to New York and leaving Minnesota and getting settled back in Michigan, where I'm from. And like you said, real estate and trying to sort through finances and all these different things, trying to be a grown up. So it has been a crazy year or so. I love the story of your childhood, the relationship with your brother, Trevor, Chester. Chesterfield Township native. What does it mean to you and to your family to come from Chesterfield Township and now to have the success that you're having playing at the highest level of football and when you get to come home like you are right now? I take a lot of pride in it. Growing up, there wasn't many professional athletes from our area in general, Macomb County, Chesterfield. It was exciting when somebody went Division One. Taiwan Jones went to Michigan State. That was a big deal. Uh, Jeff Lindsay was a guy when he went to Purdue. He was from Lance Cruz North. He's He might be the only guy to really 
go on a full ride scholarship to a Division One school from Lance Cruz North that I can think of. So it was just kind of something that wasn't that normal compared to a lot of places that are used to that. Growing up, I always wanted to basically tell my parents, you know, I want to be the first Division One athlete in our family. It ended up happening. It just was a little different road to make that reality. I did make it happen. My brother is a big reason for it, and my sister. If I don't talk about her, I will get in trouble. So I take a lot of pride in it. My brother took a lot of pride in it. We were all athletes, the whole family. We take pride in Lance Cruz North. We went to school. When you look back on your childhood, we've had guys like Taiwan Jones on. I think about even the helmets that we got here. We've got Benny Fowler, who came out of Detroit Country Day. We got our boy Lamar Woodley. A lot of these great athletes come out of the state of Michigan, and they play at the highest levels. Oftentimes, they reflect back to someone or something in their childhood is really what got them to start having this vision and this dream of playing at the highest level. And you were a two-sport athlete, so it was basketball and football. Can you recall back to someone or something in particular that really got you thinking big that you could play at that level? I don't know if there's a specific moment. Thinking back on it, and my dad played football at Grand Valley, and I thought that was the coolest thing in the world, right? When my dad was young, he could bench 400 pounds, and I'm like, oh, my dad was so strong. Or he played Division II football. Like, oh, that's awesome. And me and my brother idolized that. My mom played volleyball at Grand Valley. So sports were always a part of our life. But for me, it was just something that I just fell in love with. I mean, Sports Center 24-7. I used to live at the YMCA in Mount Clemens. My dad would almost get mad at me after my parents split up. I'd always just kind of go to the Y. Can I go play basketball? And he's like, oh, I want to spend time with my son, but I just wanted to play sports nonstop. So that's just what I did. Really, it was basketball. I loved basketball. I wanted to go to the NBA. Obviously, that didn't happen. We pivoted and, and switched and made it happen. That's an interesting story in itself because you committed to Northwood to play basketball. And so you left for Northwood to play basketball. Coming out of high school, you had accolades in both sports. At that time, what made you think, I'm gonna pursue basketball and I'm going to Northwood? Basketball is just my life. I travel basketball, football I just kind of played. I always played football. I uh, started playing tackle football, I was eight years old, third grade. I always played basketball since when four years old, whenever you can start playing basketball. Yeah. Played literally for the Mount Clemens Barracudas and went to middle school play, went to high school and then my senior year, after my junior year of basketball, we played in the Final Four, lost in the semifinals to Saginaw, Lamar Woodley. So we lost to them in the Final Four. And after that, Northwood University offered me a full-ride scholarship to play basketball. And at that time, I was the first person in my family to have a full-ride scholarship. So I was like, I'm not going to play football my senior year. I'm just going to focus on basketball. Got my senior year to play still. And my best friend was a quarterback at that time. And so, like, I'm not really doing anything. And he's like, you got to play. And I'm like, I'm not playing. We were like 0-27 going to my senior year. We haven't won a football game in three years. We ran an unbalanced offense. It was just brutal. And we got a new coach that my senior year, and he came in and said, like, we're going to host our first ever playoff game. We're going to win our first ever playoff game. And I'm sitting there like, we're all like, well, bullshit. <laughs> we haven't won a game in three years. We don't know what it's even like to win. Uh, so I wasn't going to play. One of my best friends convinced me to play. He was a quarterback at the time. He convinced me to play, so I ended up playing. The first game of the season, we won. And that was a shock because we didn't know how it felt to win a football game. And we went on to go 8-3, and three, host our first ever playoff game, what? win our first ever playoff game. We lost in the district finals to Macomb, Dakota. Kind of after that, I started getting recruited by a lot of MAC schools. And then Illinois was like the one big school that was kind of looking at me. And I was like kind of starstruck. I'm like, no way. Like Division one schools are looking at me. So I talked to Northwood and I told them I wanted to kind of wait out and fill out football a little bit. And they're like, oh, if you if you wait it out, we can't promise your scholarship would be there. They give you the whole try to put pressure on you to sign. And I was their number one recruit in that class to play basketball. So at that point, I'm like, I'm the first one to go to college full ride, get free school. I'll just go there. I'll be the best person to ever play at Northwood. I'll go overseas and play basketball, I'll make good money. And I thought I had it all figured out. I'm like, it'll be fine. And so I signed early signing period before my senior year, so right after football season, my senior year, going into my senior year of basketball. So I signed to go there and played my senior year of basketball, and that's kind of it. That's how it began. You get to Northwood, and just within a matter of a few months, your mindset started to shift back to maybe I should be playing football, right? Can you take our listeners through that process, and can you recall back to them? I remember like it was yesterday because I went up there for summer. We had basketball workouts, summer classes, and I was up there, and I was just going through it. Just typical leaving home for the first time, going to college, being homesick, missing my girlfriend at the time. Just going to call my dad, like, I gotta come home. This is summer, like, school hasn't even started yet. And uh, he's telling me stories about how he had a hard time, and what he went through when he first went to Grand Valley, coming from where he came from. And so I suck it up, I come home for a little break before I gotta go back for actual school to start. When I got back there, I just, 
I don't know. I just felt like I kind of sold myself short signing, early signing period and going Division two. I had a couple of mid-majors like Oakland, University of Detroit, Mercy, kind of looking at me for basketball. And I kind of felt like I just sold myself short. So I started looking at Oakland and Eastern and, and UAD to see if what, are, like, what point guards do they have, what shooting guards do they have. Maybe I can transfer there or, or go over there and start playing. I can make the Division one thing happen and still play basketball. Like I know I can do it. I was going through that and my high school basketball coaches and everybody just telling me just like relax. Like it's your first semester in college. Everybody goes through this. I wanted to come home, the homesickness, the just new stuff and the transition. And I'm like, no, guys, I'm, I got to leave. Like I just couldn't stand it. Looking back at it, they were right. It was the homesick and the transition. Yes. That was really hard for me. But I like to think that I, I was on to something. After that kind of happened, I went home, and I was at Buffalo Wild Wings. That was my buddy, Alec. He was the high school, my high school quarterback for most of my career. And we're watching. It was Michigan State was playing, and Josiah Price was the tight end there. And I think he scored like 11 touchdowns this senior year, so I'm just all stick nods in the red zone. And he caught a touchdown. I'm like, I think I can do that. Like, if he can do that, I can do that. Nothing against Josiah. He was a great college tight end. But of I'm just like, I can do I'm like, I think I can do that. And after that, I started looking into colleges. I'm like, okay, Central Michigan, what do their tight ends look like? What walk ons do they have? Michigan State. So I started Coach Blackwell. He does sound, sound mind, sound body in, in Detroit yeah, now. He yeah, was at Michigan right. State at the time. Yeah. And so I, my brother went up there for a visit when he was in high school school and I went up there and I told him I was looking to transfer and went down this this rabbit hole of trying to transfer to Michigan State and I was about to get accepted to go there but I didn't have a college math class so cause I, what I took in high school I had to take like a beginner's like intro to college like an intro sure. to math college class and I didn't have one yet so Michigan State wouldn't accept me Central Michigan was probably the school that was recruiting me the most for football to high school coach Cummings was offensive line coach he recruited my area I reached out to him, like, hey, coach, like, I, I'm looking to transfer and walk on. And so I talked to him. They take my stuff. They call me during winter break. They're like, we're going to we're gonna let you walk on. We only get 105 spots, but you can come for spring ball. It doesn't guarantee you uh, you yeah. know, a spot on the on the real roster, but you can come for spring ball, and we'll, and we'll see how it goes. And I remember running around the house, like, I'm, I'm doing it. I'm going to Division One. I. I made it happen. I didn't care if I was a walk on. I didn't care what it was. I was just happy I made it happen. I went up there for orientation, and right before the couple of days before I went to orientation, Coach Cummings left. He took the offensive line job at Connecticut. Oh, that's right. And I'm like, okay, so the one guy I knew, yeah. I just left a full-ride scholarship at Northwood. I'm walking on to pay for school at Central Michigan. I'm switching sports. I'm going to a Division One school instead of a Division Two school. And then the one coach that helped me get there leaves. So I'm like, oh, crap. And I get there, and Coach Gino Gadula, he's uh, – He's at Cincinnati now, I think. He showed me around, and they had showed me the gloves and the locker room. I just thought it was the coolest thing in the world coming from Northwood. Yeah, then we kind of transitioned into college. We speak a lot about how the wars won in the mind first. You first have to be able to see it and believe it yourself before you even start putting in the work. Yeah. When you got to Central Michigan, when did you know that you could do it? Was there a moment or a period in that first spring ball or off season when you're like okay i sized up the environment and i know i can compete at this level it did take me a little bit of time because i had some there were some bumps in the road when i when i first got there spring ball is five weeks so the first three weeks of spring ball i'm playing wide receiver i'm probably 200 pounds 195 pounds i'm not the fastest kid in the world not the at this time i'm scrawny just starting to kind of work out a little bit and put on muscle Three weeks at wide receiver, and they switch me to DN. They bring me in. They're like, "We're gonna move you. To we want to move you to defensive end." They give me this spiel about how it's premier position. I'm a walk on. I'm like, "Why are they giving me this this spiel about being a premier position?" I'm just trying to like, work my prove I can play. be here yeah. and get a scholarship here. And so I go to I play defensive end for the last two weeks of spring ball. I'm calling my parents. I'm calling like I gotta. I'm like I might have messed up. I'm playing defense now. <laughs> I don't want to play defense. People, like, you could be good at it. I'm like, I don't care if I could be good. I don't want. To, like, that's just not me. Like, I, I just I've never done it before. So I go home for the summer, and I'm just we're, I'm working construction at Rams Construction. We were doing parking garages down at Wayne State. Jack Cameron all day it was horrible, and I complained to my parents about that too. I'm like, it was awful. It was awful. It was awful. Oh, my God. I wake up at 4 in the morning. I'm Jack Cameron at 5. I'm supposed to still try to work out. 18, 19 years old. Yeah, I just left a full-ride scholarship. Everybody was freaking out that I was leaving free school. Then I switch, and they move my position. I'm at home working construction. I'm like, what am I doing? Uh, I used to complain to my parents, like, I can't do it. If you want me to be good at football, I can't be working 5 to 5. And they're like, they're like here he goes, trying to get out of another job. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And that's what it looked like. So they're just panicking. You know, I was working all these jobs. I worked for like a month or something. I'm like, I can't do that. If I'm gonna play sports, like I gotta yeah. focus on sports. And so I'm working construction, and my buddy, 
my other quarterback in high school, he's going to Siena Heights. And I'm like, all right. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go to Siena Heights. I go there. I'm like, I can play football and basketball. I'm like, for sure. I'm like, I go there. I play both. I play both sports. I'll be an All-American. I'll have, a good, I'll have fun. I have a friend there. And we'll be good to go. And he, my, my buddy's all about it. He's like, yeah, come to Siena Heights. Like, I want to throw to you. And I'm like, I'm like, cool, whatever. So I went to Siena Heights and I did a workout. I do the workout. And they're like, yeah, we're going to offer you a scholarship. And I'm like, all right, cool. So they sent a letter to a release form to Central Michigan for me to get my release. And Coach Rickhamstrick, who was a defensive line coach, who was technically my position coach at that time, calls me. He's like, we just got this, this thing from Siena Heights and about a release. Like, what's going on? And I'm like, I don't, I don't really know what that's about. I'm, I'm not leaving. <laughs> and I mean, you're getting the raw and uncut version right here, so do, do what you want with it. I'm like, I don't really know what it's about, but I do want to switch to tight end. Like, I, you know, I've never really played defense before, and I've been wanting to talk to you guys about switching to tight end. He's like, okay, well, let me talk to him. We'll see what happens. At that point, I'm like, I'm going to walk on You know, who yeah. knows what they're going to say? And they call me back. And they're like, okay, you're going to come into camp at tight end. So I'm like, I'm like, yeah. So now I'm pumped. I'm like, I'm grinding. And I'm like, I'm back where I need to be. And I go into, go into camp. My first camp was my sophomore year. And I had to sit out a year and a half after I transferred. I sat out my first spring and my first whole year in Central. Yeah. So the first year and a half of Central, I sat out because of transfer rules. I get there, and I'm like the eighth tight end, seventh tight end on the depth chart. But I'm playing tight end, and I'm happy. And then it really kind of began. There's gold and there's a lot of coal in that, in that story. But look, I, I, I'm going to say, Mr. Conklin, I'm glad that you were hard on him. Because, I mean, good, right? We need that. As sons of strong men, we need strong men. We need strong men to be the influence in our lives, right? The gold, though, really the one that I love was you never stopped pushing the envelope around what you wanted. And I think that's so important. I just had breakfast with my buddy David Gatch and his son Avery Gatch is highly recruited right now. Yeah. AG, shout out to you, kiddo. I want to give a special shout out to my friend Dana Cornelius. Dana's the CEO, co-owner of Sporta Kings, the, the gear that I am rocking today. Yes, folks, I do wear more than a blue suit, white shirt, and a tie. Check out their website, S-O-K-F-Y dot com if you drop in the word podium in the discount code they're going to send you an amazing 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 package of whatever you order with 20 percent off check it out sport of kings love dana and tiffany as young men and young women were often influenced by the pessimistic or small thinking of people who really love and care about us sadly I don't know. I never really thought about much of anything else. Like it was, it was selfish in a standpoint, right? Like not wanting to work, want to just focus on sports and football. But like you said, that's what allowed me to make this dream come true. That's the powerful part of it is that your ability to be selfish allowed you to drown out all the white noise of pessimism yeah. and small thinking. Yeah. And here you are, yeah. Chesterfield Township native. You didn't necessarily have 15 guys come out of that program that you could look up to and say, yeah. man, they paved the way to the league. And yet you, through a number of pivots and U-turns, you're playing exactly where you thought you would play as a young boy. I just wanted to be the first guy to go Division One, the first guy to go to the NFL. I wanted to get my jersey hung up in the, in the gym. All those things you see on movies. When you look back at your years in high school and college, was there a person outside of your father and your siblings and your mom that had a really strong influence on where you've gotten your drive and your perseverance and your grit from? Because you've bounced back from a lot of stuff. I think it's got to be my mom and my dad. There's not like a ton of specific moments. There's so many things you pick up on subconsciously that your parents do that when my parents got divorced, my mom nonstop worked, right? My dad nonstop worked. And yes. I, I know I, I subconsciously learned that from them. And then I looked at where I look at where my family is now. My brother's a Navy SEAL. My sister's going to law school at UAD. You know, I play in the NFL. So there's three kids that all came, that came from two parents that are all doing things that take a lot of determination, hard work, and grit. As a family, we got a lot of like you know we love hard, we fight hard. But I think that all goes hand to hand with us being as successful as we are. We wear our emotions on our sleeve, and I think that's really paid off for us. Obviously, it's not always the best way to handle things at times. We're all very strong-willed and work really hard, and that's why we're chasing some of the things we're chasing. I do want to recognize that the amount of success that you and your siblings have had, it's special. Yeah. It's I'm unique. Think about that. I feel the same way about my brothers. To have each of you 
driving and thriving and persevering and winning yeah. at things, all things that are very difficult. It's got to feel really special for your folks. Yeah, I think it's really special for them. They've overcome so many things to get to where they are at. Where did we get it from? It had to be from our parents, right? But I don't, there's not like a specific moment or I think it's like you said, we were raised by two great people and we yes. learned from them and we learned from their good things they did. We learned from the bad things they did because we all have good and bad things we do. It ended up working out. You're heading into your last couple of years in college. Can you think back to one or two of your favorite teammates and what made them great teammates to you? At this point, I have no friends. I just, I'm the last in the depth chart of Central Michigan. I'm just going to start being able to play. Some of my best friends now, Jay Roberson, Amari. Oh, so yeah. Jay walks on that fall. So I've been there for a semester. He walks on. So we're walking on together basically at the same time. Amari comes in as a true freshman. Those two guys end up becoming two of my best friends still to this day. But I had, there was a lot of special people I, I came across playing there. Coach Shromore, he's the offensive coordinator at uh, Michigan now. But he was, my, he was my tight end yeah. coach. He had a huge hand in yeah. all my success, well, most of my success as a tight end. I mean, yeah. I wouldn't nearly be the tight end I am today without him as a coach. A lot of the guys that I battled with at tight end, when I had to go from being the last on the depth chart to the first on the depth chart, they really all played a really important role in it. And I'm, I still talk to a lot of them to this day. So... And there's just a ton of special people. We had such a special team at Central Michigan. We underachieved a little bit in our years there, which yeah. I think everybody I play with would agree on that. I'd like to think that was just a special place and a special team at that time. What specifically about tight end had you thinking, I know I could take this position to the highest level? I just knew the attributes that I always had as a football player, being able to go up and high point the ball and get the ball, being fluid, my fluidity from basketball, I knew it could translate. And I felt like I was athletic, more athletic than most tight ends. So I felt like... I already had traits that could be refined to make me good at, at that position. I didn't realize at that time how far away I was from being any what any bit decent at that position, but that's where Coach Moore comes in, into play. A lot of the stuff I went through as a as a walk on there really helped me when I got to the NFL. Being the last on the depth chart, being a walk on, not getting reps. Like I used to watch and the freshmen that come in, they would get they catch a stick a stick route or a certain route, and like everybody would the you know, coaches would praise it, and I'm like I could have did that just. <laughs> I just didn't get the opportunity. I was just on the sideline watching, you know, because I only got whatever, yeah. one or two reps that day. That was frustrating. When you had a bad day, I feel like it was the end of the world at that time in my life. And when an older guy finally would come up to you, and like I was playing my butt off on scout team, and people were starting to realize, like, okay, this guy could probably be decent. And those old guys would come up to you and be, hey, man, like, you did a great job today or something. That also was like the greatest thing in the world, right? So low was always so low, and high was so high. My sophomore year behind Ben McCord was a good tight end, had a good season there, was in a couple mini camps. Junior year, I had a good junior year, played well, started talking to agents, and I'm like, okay, I got it. this is when it was real. Like, junior year happened, and I think I had 500 yards, five touchdowns. Agents are reaching out to me. I'm meeting with agents. I'm like, this is reachable now. Going into my senior year, first day of camp, break my foot. And I'm like, oh, crap. Like, all this oh, basketball, yes. transferring, yes. walking on, switching sports, almost leaving, and all these things. And then we get to my senior year. I'm about to, I'm like, okay, I'm primed to have the best year of my career. I'm like, okay, if I go and have a thousand yards as a tight end and whatnot, I could be a top three, three round pick coming out of a small school. And I break my foot the first day of camp. And that was a whole other mess. We're trying to sort through that. Will I be able to redshirt? Cause I already redshirted. Will I be able to come back from this? We had five other people with the same injury that I had. And you know, I just went on a deep dive on everybody that had this injury. How yeah. fast did they come back? How did they come back fast? Who rebroke it? I ended up coming back in like seven weeks, playing my first game, first game back, had like 136 yards and two touchdowns. And there were some things in between there. Like if I would have got hurt that game, then I would have not been able to red shirt and been done. If I was healthy the rest of the season, I was just healthy the rest of the season. So there was a lot on the line right there if that foot didn't hold up. I've heard you reference in previous conversations that that – break going into your senior season was definitely by far the biggest athletic adversity you've ever had. 100%. They say that winners roll with winners and you got to audit your circle often. Who was in your circle intimately outside of your family that was really in your corner at that time that you'd say, man, that person in my life and that season of my life was very, very helpful to me. I was heartbroken. When that happened, I had to be around my teammates. It was hard for me to not cry, and I don't like crying in front of people. That's not something I enjoy doing. So being in front of my teammates it was just hard, but I also think Amari, Jay, a lot of my close friends at Central Michigan were really the ones that understood it because some of them have dealt with injuries or dealt yes. with certain things. I never dealt with an injury yeah. really at that point in my life. After like, I kind of realized, like, what am I going to do, sit here and feel bad for myself? Like At that point, you know, what I'm trying to get better at now is – how do you react to stuff, right? Am I going to 
I'm not going to get too high. I'm just going to make what's the most logical decision to make the best outcome after I figure out my news. Whether that's yes. good news or bad news. I'm going to step yes. back. Okay, what's the what's the what's next the decision? Next that's all that matters at that point. Yeah. I can't think like what happens in four weeks or what happens in a year, whether it's good or bad, positive or negative. It's just more what's the next step for me? How do I make the next step hopefully give me the best outcome when that outcome does happen? So I like to think it was my teammates at Central Michigan at that time and some of my close friends. Mari Coleman, you're a good buddy, a speed and agility coach, Godspeed, look him up. He's incredible. He's trying to turn my children into professional athletes right now as we speak too. You show up well your senior season and something I've heard other people say that you've not referenced is how well you showed up at the combine. Yeah. You had a great combine. How much do you think that really played into the fact that even with the injuries, even playing at CMU, which was a slightly smaller program yeah. that you could have probably played, at. you could have played at a big program and showed up well as well. How much did that combine influence the fact that you got drafted fifth, you had a nice run with the Minnesota Vikings and you got to live out your dream? So I played the last six games of my senior year. I had a good year. And the one thing I really wanted was a senior bowl invite. I just wanted to be able to go to these events that the Power 5 guys used to go to. And for a guy coming from Central Michigan, I want to go and compete against those people. So I was worried about not getting a senior bowl invite after being hurt. I still got the senior bowl invite. I did all right at the senior bowl. I, I definitely think I could have had a better showing. It wasn't a bad showing, just not. We all hold ourselves to, we all want ourselves to do well. And it was like, I did all right. And uh, going to the combine and... I had a really good combine. I didn't run as well as I wanted to run, but I had a I had a good combine. But that was just, and a lot of people wanted to say, like, oh, we don't know if you look the same. A lot of scouts and stuff said, I don't know if you look the same after your foot injury. And I'm sitting here like, I think I look better personally, but I guess it is what it is. And then we go to Minnesota in, in the fifth round, and I was excited about it. And then that had its own adversity that, that came with that. And so, and everything that we just talked about is what I want to say helped me get make things happen in Minnesota, get to a second contract, and be where we are now. Yeah, and congrats. Second contract, New York Jets. So much excitement out there. But before we get to the excitement of today, what does it look like to train today? What does training look like for an NFL tight end? We've got a lot of young listeners, and I know even Atlas, who's here in the building today, he's like, I can't wait to hear how he trains. It's been an ongoing process. The one thing I've always pride of myself on is how hard I work. Me and my brother, we compete about it all the time, and he's probably the one person that I think might work harder than me. So for me, it was just, you know, it was building the routine. When I first got to the NFL, I was like, oh, just trying to survive and stay alive. And then it was, okay, how do I need to train in the off season now that you're not structured all the time? In college, you got winter conditioning, spring ball, summer conditioning. You never stop. In the NFL, you get done with the season, and now you're on your own. And it's like, am I doing the right thing? Should I be going to these bomberitos in Florida, these special exos and these special places? Am I doing the right thing? Am I not doing the right thing? And that anxiety that I tend to, I, I, I have my battles with anxiety at times. I think that anxiety is what allows me to be who I am. Now. It, it makes me work hard because it's always that, am I doing enough? Can I be doing more? Should I be sitting on the couch right now? Could I be catching some more footballs? Could I be doing a more, another workout? Could I be doing some recovery stuff? Over time, I've kind of slowly built a, a routine and, figured out how to handle those thoughts and putting everything into a calendar and having plans. So once I'm done with what I've decided I need to do to be successful, I got the, I can, the rest of the day, I can relax and I don't have to worry about if I need to be doing more. That's well said. I'm smiling a ton because we just had Jim Kilbasso on and Jim trains some of the highest performers in many leagues, but with a strong concentration in the NFL, Jim spoke about how there's so many creative workouts out there now. Yeah. And most of what really needs to happen consistently with discipline and commitment yeah. are the fundamentals. Yeah. And you're more of a fundamental guy, right? I'm at a point in my life where it's more about functional strength, injury prevention, strength and range. How do I become faster? How do I become, how do I work on my craft? But how do I also have the strength and, and the areas that I need it to be healthy and to be successful? Then I went on a deep dive this year into more of my health when it came to blood work and GI tests. I went through some a little adversity this year, and I whenever I tend to go through adversity, I just I really I think it locks me in even more than I, I already am. So I went down some deep dives with just my health and trying to maximize everything possible from my body standpoint. And then I have a really good plan outside of stuff with Amari and Doug Van Elslander, who runs Relentless Pursuit in Troy, who does my oh. who does my strength training. With Amari, yeah. Amari trains there. And I used to be like, okay, so I have some of my good friends training me. Like, is that okay? And I had that yes. battle in my head, and I watched people go to all these expensive places that everybody knows about. And over time, like, I would look at their workouts, and I see what I'm doing, and I'd be like, yeah, I don't need to. Go, I don't need to go there because I want to be home in my house and be able to have my downtime, 
be around the people I want to be around and people I love yes. and care about that can rejuvenate me and help me keep being me, but also get the, the best work in possible. And I think going to year six, the last couple of years that I've finally got a good grasp. Mm-hmm. I don't want to say I got it. Those are like the words you don't want to say. You never really got it, but having progress yeah. and I have a really good routine together of my workouts, my speed training, my football training, my food, my supplements, and I'm primed. I go back to our conversation today, we go all the way to the beginning and there's just so much gold in the story of your life of pursuing the vision for your life of playing at the highest level in an unflinching manner. You're just completely undeterred. You're obsessed and you've overcome adversity after adversity after adversity. You break your foot going into your senior year of college. You still show out in the last six games of the year. You perform exceptionally well in the combine. You go 157th, the 157th pick in the fifth round to the Vikings, and then take us to those next four years. You're at a high, right? We have a draft party. Everybody's there. I knew I was going to go. In the, I, at that point, I kind of figured I'd go four, round four through seven. It was, all, it was an awesome event, right? All the people I loved around me. My mom's crazy. So, like, everybody. I mean, you probably baby, my babysitter when I was eight was probably there. So the news was there. Everybody. Mom crazy in a good way. So, it was awesome. You know, we're, we're at a high right there. And then we go to Minnesota. I actually meet Scott, my wife now, kind of start talking a couple weeks around the draft time. So, we go to Minnesota. And Kyle Rudolph is already there. David Morgan's the blocking tight end. Both good friends. And both those people I still talk to pretty often. That was the battle, just trying to figure it out. Like, how, how do you be a pro? How to survive in the NFL? I'm a tight end three, so I'm on special teams mainly. I'm playing maybe 10 to 20 plays a game, just depending on the game. Some games it might have been two plays, some games it might have been 20 plays. And that's kind of how it was for my first year. You know, my second, going into my second year, they draft Irv Smith from Alabama in the second round. So now I got Kyle Rudolph, who's getting paid six, seven million dollars a year. Irv Smith, who gets drafted in the second round. You know, David Morgan ended up being done because of some injury stuff. And so I'm here sitting at tight end three again. And that's kind of like with the politics. Politics were frustrating for me. That was it when I was a walk on at Central Michigan. Now I'm kind of noticing it in the NFL. And I was prepared for it in a sense because of what I did have to go through of being a walk on and the yes. adversity I faced earlier in life. I knew how talented I could be. I just needed the opportunity. So I used to complain to my agent, like, what are we going to do? Like, I just need an opportunity. I need to be able to do something out there so that I can get a chance to go get another contract and go somewhere and, and play after this. And he's like, you just got to be patient, you got to be patient. I'm like, all right, I'll be patient. But I was getting sick of being patient. There'd be certain plays where like, I would be like a certain position. I was supposed to have a route, but then they would move me to block and they'd let someone else do it, like Irv or something. And I'm like, you're not even going to let me get this one play that I could get maybe for 10 games. Going to year three, and it's kind of the same situation. I'm like, okay, at this point, I got year three, four-year contract as a rookie. So I want to go, I, I want to prove something that before my fourth year. And the third year, I'm just like, I'm complaining, I complain. I'm in a bad spot. I'm just like, I'm sick of being a third string tight end. I'm sick of not getting an opportunity. It just, one day it kind of just clicked. I'm like, all right, I'm done complaining. I'm just going to go out there and I'm going to ball on scout team and play as well as I can. And anytime they needed a wide receiver on scout team or something, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go play wide receiver because I had a chance to run receiver routes and That's show them that it. I could do that. And there was like a couple little times where Coach Zim would like mention me at the end of practice or stuff. And I started seeing a little headway in the sense of maybe getting recognized for a little bit or something, even though it was just me on scout team. But one time we were playing Green Bay that week and I was doing this, I was doing the starting defense so bad they had to stay after the DBs had to stay after for like 20 minutes and I had like in practice I probably had 200 yards in practice I was having a day and I was you know I think I was being Alan Lazard who's my new teammate oh, teammate man. in Green Bay now like that's who I was being the big receiver for Green Bay that yeah. that week on scout team so we started getting there and then I think I got my first target that Irv Smith got banged up and I got to play Monday Night Football against Chicago week eight and I got my first target first catch of the year in my my third year is like an eight yard choice route against the Bears that was my first target first catch of that season. The year before, in year two, I got my first target and first catch against the Broncos in like week 10 on a third and 14 play. So the last two years, I didn't get a ball thrown to me until week 10 and week eight. And at that point, it's like, it's hard to be nice to be like, it's hard to like, you haven't caught the ball in forever in a live game. You're still trying to figure it out. You can do whatever you want in practice, but until you get better, until you get real live game action, it's hard to develop in the, in the NFL. So that happens and Irv comes back. I, I, I kind of go back to being tight end three for two, three games. And then Kyle Rudolph gets banged up in the Jacksonville game. Irv was kind of banged up. Rudy was kind of banged up. I played that whole game. I was exhausted. And then I go into the last four games of my third year. It's just me and Irv. I ended up with 190 yards and a touchdown to finish my third year. And before this year, I was really big into goals in college. Like I'd write my, my season goals, my print spring ball goals, winter goals. Yes. And they hang on my locker, and I was huge about it. My first two years in the league, I didn't write goals. 
Uh, I just think I was just trying to figure it out. My third year, I, we bought a house. We got settled in Minnesota. I feel like I kind of, that was my first year of figuring out my off season and like feeling like I had a good off season plan. And like I sat down, I wrote goals, zero drops, zero MAs, 80% blocking grade. Man. And I wrote, I want to have 20 plus catches, 200 plus yards and two plus touchdowns. If I can do that in my third year, like that gives me a good stepping stone going to year four. I'm still tight in three going into this season. Sure. Who knows if we get the opportunity. Sure. How it all played out, those injuries, Rudy getting banged up, Irv getting banged up, me getting to play the last four games, and I end up with 19 catches for 190 yards and one touchdown. So that's when I went back. It's like, okay, I need to make sure I get back to writing my goals because at that point, I feel like I spoke it into existence. It did not look that's like I was going right. to be anywhere near 200, yeah. 200 yards, 20 catches, and two touchdowns. And somehow – Call it what you want. We get to that. We get right to those numbers almost with four games. So at that point, I'm like, okay, I need to get back to speaking things into existence, being positive. And then we go into my fourth year in the league, contract year. I'm in a good spot. Like they end up moving on from Kyle Rudolph. He goes to the Giants, and it's going to be me and Irv Smith, tight end one and tight end two. I'm like, okay, good. Like if I'm second string tight end, I'll be able to go in. I'll be able to get another 200 yard season. That should be able to get me like a one or two year deal somewhere for like some decent money. It's not. I shouldn't be hopping around sure. for vet minimum at that point. I pull a hammy, I miss like almost all of camp. Irv Smith ends up tearing his meniscus and missing and missing the whole season. And so I come back after my you know, hamstring and I get to start the whole entire season my fourth year and end up going for five hundred and ninety yards, yeah. sixty some catches, almost yeah, six hundred yards and, and three touchdowns. I just it went all the way back. At that point in my life I'm like, wow. I talked to my friends and my friend like my buddy Sean, he was just like He's like, I don't know, man. I'm not going to lie. He's like, I just, I look at everything. And I'm like, it just has to be your destiny. The, the good things, the bad things, the way things have worked. Because you need so many things to go in your favor also. Like, yeah. you got to stay healthy. You need yeah. things to work on. If they, I needed someone to get banged up. Rudy and Irv weren't her bad, but I needed them to get banged up that third year so I could ease myself into a starting role. Instead of just going and starting my fourth year without ever playing, right? they might have went and tried to get someone else because they wouldn't have been sure what I could do. But I got to show them the last four games of my third year because of some things that happened that gave them faith that I could handle that. Yeah, so just looking back at it, just with the walk on all these things just came to fruition at, at this point. And I'm like, wow, like, okay, I signed a good, I signed a decent contract and I'm going to New York, a new place. And There's so much gold in that track that you just ran us through too. The power of goal setting. The war being one in the mind and you speaking things into existence because you see them and believe them yourself. And I think that that's so valuable for the young men and women who want to compete and perform at the highest level of anything that's competitive. I love that you share that. So you're with the Jets now. Incredible contract. Congratulations. Congratulations to the Jets organization. I'm super excited. So I've been a Gary Vaynerchuk fanatic for over a decade. And just to see what the Jets are doing, a lot of what I've ever known about the Jets is following Gary. Yeah. And just to see what the Jets have been doing in the last couple of years, the moves they've been making, the investments they've been making into some of the best players in the league, that's got to be pretty exciting. Is the oxygen in Jetland different today than it was two years ago when you first got there? Oh, 100%. I mean, shout out to Gary V. He's awesome. He's always, you know, reaching out <laughs> before games, after games, inviting us to dinner. He's an awesome guy. He's a very genuine guy from, like, my, you know, little encounters I've had with him. But, yeah, Jet, Jetland, it's, it's a special place right now, right? When I got there, like, we're in a, like, they're very, the fans, Easter Fathom in, in New York. You're doing good. They love you. You're doing bad. They don't love you, really. That can be pretty brutal. But they just, it's because how much they love their Jets. You got to love the pressure and what comes with that. Because you yeah. want to make you want to make that city proud, and there's not a better place to go and try to win a Super Bowl than than New York City. Last year we end up having what some people would say a surprising year, in a sense, surprising and then disappointing the way it finished. Heading into this year, I think last year we went through a lot of things and built a, and built a lot of things as a team, chemistry wise, and went through some adversity. That's going to help us help us this year as we add some huge pieces like Aaron Rodgers, Alan Lazard, a ton of different people, Adrian Amos, and. A lot of guys that you probably don't like because of being a Bears fan. We, we have such a talented team now, and you can't get too high. You can't listen to the media, right? The media's no. going to tell you how great you are right now, and then you lose one game, and they're going to tell you how bad you are. And I think last year helped prepare this team. I think the leadership we're going to get from some of these guys, Randall Cobb, Aaron Rodgers, that have so much experience and that can help this team grow at a, at a really fast rate and kind of weather some things. Because in a football season, things are going to be good. Things are going to be bad. You're going to go through a lot of different things during a 17-game season. I just think we're, as a unit, offensively, defensively, special teams, coaches, I think everywhere we're very prepared to, to handle this, this season. The various guys that I know that are still in the league now and in conversations, they talk about how Coach Sal is one of the best player coaches. Yeah, yeah. 
in the NFL. Dearborn, Michigan native. Can you talk about what it's like to play for a coach like him? Yeah, that was a huge thing when I signed there. Mike LaFleur, Sala, both Michigan guys. Both were at Central Michigan at one point in their career. Coach LaFleur, the offensive coordinator yeah. last year, was from Mount Pleasant. And Coach Sala was a GA at Central Michigan at one, at one point. I love that because Michigan ties them. Like, Michigan uh, ties. Like, there's always going to be some type of love sauce. between. Yeah, sauce. Like, there's just so, there's so many guys. Sala really, the thing I, I, I love and respect about him the most is what he expects from his team and his players. Like, he lives that too, right? He, you know, the hard work, the you know, all gas, no breaks, the, the callousing. <laughs> Uh, what we what we do as a, as a team, yes. what he preaches as a coach, he lives that too. The way he works out, the yeah. way his routine is. Not that sad, I know everything, but you see him in the morning running stairs or killing himself in a oh. workout at five, six in the morning, right? So he he lives that life, and it's easy to follow a man that, that, that lives by his lives by what he says and his actions match his words. So I love playing for him. I love that. I'm thinking about Sauce Gardner's arrival there. Was there a bond at all because of the Michigan thing? Me and Sauce have actually been bonding a lot more this year because we, we've been around each other a, a lot more. When I first saw when you first, he first got there, I'm like, man, this guy, like, he's six threes. He looks like an alien out there. Now let's see how it translates and how seamless the transition was for him was special. And as a DB, they all have that confidence, arrogance, crap talking. Like, that's what yeah. all DBs are. Yeah. The fact that everything he did and said matched how he played, it was special because DJ Reed is across from him at the other corner. That's and right. he's one of the top, he's a top five, top 10 corner in the league, in my, in my opinion. Yeah. And probably in most people's opinion that really truly know football, Sauce gets a lot of credit because of Sauce being Sauce, being doing it at such a young age, just everything that comes with it. But DJ's, DJ's special too. But I say that because that's also how good Sauce is, that like he takes up so much publicity in a sense yeah. because he is special and he's got another special corner right across from him. Yeah, it's been great to watch my growing interest and advocacy of the Jets, these incredible Michigan ties. It's just so special to see, and I, I know that you're going to stack another great season this year. As we go to wrap up right now, have you written your goals for this season yet? Yeah, I have. I've actually written them a couple times. I'm not going to share any specifics, but I do feel like this season, what I've gone through in the off season and, and the routine and the structure I put together for myself, I do think that I'm primed to do what I'm, I've been speaking into existence in these goals. I think what I'm writing down on paper and what I think I can make happen in my head, I think this is the year that I... I make it happen. I love that. Hey, man, it was an absolute treat to be together with you today. I know it's tough with the schedule that you're keeping in the offseason. Congrats to you and Scotty on the wedding, purchasing real estate, traveling a little bit. You got to rest the soul. And you're going from here to working out. Yeah, it'll be fun with Amari. Godspeed. Yeah. <laughs> and Doug. And Sean. All three of them will be there. So, oh, yeah. Yeah, we'll get some one-on-ones. We'll get some speed training. We'll lift. We'll do. We'll have a good day. Shout out to Amari and Sean again. Loved having you. We got to do this again soon. And obviously, from our family, our firm, everybody on the show, we're just wishing you the most incredible season. I appreciate you. Thanks for having me. Folks, thanks so much for listening. And thanks to my guest, Tyler Conklin. Connect with Tyler on Instagram at T, the letter T for Tyler underscore flight one. If you like what you heard today, please be sure to follow, rate, and review at the podium on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your shows. You can also follow our show on Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok at podium underscore podcast post about the show on social media and tag us and we'll repost to share our gratitude i hope gary vaynerchuk does that also consider telling a friend about the show friend to friend is still the best way to get the word out about our conversations and i hope to see you next time